<laughs> Our guest in this segment is the Senate President, Craig Blair. Craig, good morning to you. Good morning. Hey, I want to tell you when a writer is disabled. That's when people quit reading what you write. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, that would make you impoverished. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure they're writing that into an insurance policy, though. <laughs> Although, as, as a writer, really, he doesn't care if you read the book. He just wants you to buy the book. <laughs> that is so true. He doesn't get paid if you read that it. That is so true. He only gets paid if you buy it. I want, I want libraries to buy the books, but I want people not to check them out of the library. I want them to go and read, you know, buy their own. So it's <laughs> Capitalist. Yeah, well, that's that's all through and through. All, all works that way. Good morning. Craig, we had uh, in the last segment Nate Kane, candidate for Congress, who was talking about mineral rights and the dropping of revenues in the state. And the uh, folks that he's been talking to suspect that there's something going on that doesn't match up with the contracts uh, that they signed. And, and Nate's point being is that this ultimately can affect the state revenue-wise. We could be losing some money on uh, revenue for severance taxes. I listened to that segment as I was driving in. And uh, so let's talk the story a little bit about severance taxes. For, uh, for the, the last month, we were above the revenue estimates for $8.9 million for the severance tax. And I think Dylan uh, has the graphic. You can put that up, Dylan, if you want, as Craig talks about it. Okay. But uh, for the year so far, um, we're five months in. It's uh, $44.6 million below the revenue estimates. So this uh, is an indicator of the cyclic nature of, of the severance tax. It, 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 and I call it a roller coaster. It's up and down, up and down. Uh, it, I've been serving in the legislature uh, since 2003. And in 2003 was an interesting time. And that was is that we had a shortfall in our budget. And everybody was hoping that somebody from West Virginia would win the record Powerball. And they did. And that's how we filled our budget. There was a celebration down there. And I thought to myself then, I said, this is a terrible way to go about managing your budget. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when I become the finance chairman, one of the things that we did was is that we got ready and we did the flatline budget, but we made it so that the severance tax was a lower number, a more realistic number on what you could count on coming in. And as I'm, as I'm sitting there saying this, we've got a realistic number. and We're still $44 million below. But if you when we get into the rest of this here, you'll see that our, we're above revenue estimates for the year. So we're not all that dependent on the severance tax the way we used to be. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the right way to go about budgeting your government and managing your government from that standpoint and how it's collected. Um, I was asked here uh, earlier this morning about that. And there is a whole host of different ways it's collected, whether it's coal, whether it's oil, whether it's the natural gas. We took the severance tax off the timber industry, by the way. I think it was like four years ago, five years ago. I lose track of time of on things. So, But each one of them are collected differently. In Berkeley County, for instance, in Jefferson County, they get a severance tax, but it's not like it is from other parts of the state. If you're a coal-producing county, then you get way more severance tax than what you're doing if you're not. Same applies to the natural gas uh, from that standpoint. So, the, and, and there is, there, it should be that way. There's a cause and effect of to being able to help out with that. But one of the most, when I was listening to that segment, one of the things that bothered me was is somebody going into a contract with somebody and not taking a lawyer that has the expertise of what that contract is. That is probably the most important thing. You can't legislate every uh, aspect of a contract, okay? That, 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 that is impossible to be able to manage that. And even if you were capable of doing that, time changes. Five years, 10 years, the world around you changes. And the natural gas industry is a prime example of the Marcellus shale, the, the fracking, of uh, the horizontal drilling, stuff like that. The world changes around you, and you've got to be able to adapt to that. And he brought it up, Senate Bill 694. And uh, as me being Senate president, that was one of the ones that I seen an opportunity. We got that across the finish line. And what we did was we got the drillers, and we've got the uh, landowners together and be able to work that out. And we wanted to do that, I think it was six years earlier, 
My daughter actually voted against it. I, I voted that. for it. And my daughter voted against it, and she was. It was. It died on a tie vote in the House of Delegates. And uh, and just for the record, we've talked since then, and she's told me if I'd have known today what I knew, or didn't know then, I would have voted for it. But you know, I had people complaining that. Oh, your daughter's going to be your vote, a second vote for you. That wasn't never the case. That was false uh, for, from that standpoint. But it did set us behind uh, on being able to do that. And what brought the operators together and, and the landowners together was the price. Okay? The, the, the price on natural gas at that point in time was really up there. And so they said to themselves, we got to be able to figure a way out into, uh, on being able to manage this. And that's exactly what they did. They came to an agreement. But if you're into some sort of a contract, uh, and some of these are legacy contracts of uh, that have are different, that's where you need to have the attorney to come in and be able to help you manage your assets to your best of creating the law, and I don't think it's going to have a lot of effect. And when it comes to the federal side of it, oh my golly, it, 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 this is a state's issue to a greater degree. I, the last thing I want to do is see the federal government get any more involved in something like this than what they currently are. On the forty-four million dollars short, shortfall, on the conservative estimates of the severance taxes. Do we expect that there's going to be a, a pendulum swing later in the year that's going to have, make up for the $44 million? That's one question, and the other, and related to that is, did what what causes, it's not an insignificant shortfall, I guess maybe in the vast scheme of the numbers it is, but w do we know why these, these uh, shortfalls happen? Well, the, the, the shortfalls happen because of the price swings to a greater degree. It doesn't have anything to do with the previous conversation okay. that you had. It, it, the vast majority of it has to do with price when it comes to the severance tax collections of on that. And, and it, it's cyclic by nature on that. Of When the price is down, it's great for the consumer. It's great for industry. Uh, but it's not great for the severance tax. But if you have industries for instance, that uh, use that natural gas to create plastics, to create fertilizer, uh, to create energy, whatever it may be, uh, then you pick that back up on the other side of it when you have a value-added product and you see that in the corporate net. And so I, I love how we're doing this this morning. I'm going to weave in now where we're at on the corporate net. Uh, for, for the collections of for the month of November, it was uh, $9.5 million, and but we were $6.5 million above the estimate for that. And for the year, uh, the collections are $161 million, and we're $92 million above the revenue estimates on the corporate net. And so that more than offsets what we're short on the severance tax. And notice how we're getting this somewhat of a balanced budget. Let me weave in before we go much to, too much further where we're truly at of uh, five months in and our revenue collections for the month of November were $44 million above the revenue estimates. And, but for the year, it's $286 million. If, it, if you take that and divide it by five and multiply it by 12, it'll get you right around $670 million, something like that. And I'm, I'm telling you right now that our better months are ahead unless there is something that changes globally. Uh, when you hit to the, the February, March, April, May months, that's when people are out spending. They're doing their renovations. There's a lot of construction that goes on and all from that. And what happens with that is you pick that up in the consumer sales tax. You pick that up in the, uh, the personal income tax, and that helps propel you forward. The numbers are historic. You can look and see those. Uh, that it's like that in those months. So we're tracking to, to be just where I said that we'd be six to $800 million dollars ahead of revenue or above our revenue estimates. And that's a beautiful spot to be whenever you consider the fact that we cut taxes in this state between seven and eight hundred million dollars. That's that's a big deal, gentlemen. So I'm excited about it. Um, Is that a harbinger for another tax cut? Uh, there's a triggering mechanism in for that. 
of the, that would come into play. Now, let's talk about uh, how we're managing our budget and what what the process has come from that. First of all, the budget of when it comes to your excess revenues, where it's divided up basically in a third, a third, a third. You're doing a third in tax reductions. You're doing a third in capital improvements. Uh, that means infrastructure and, and stuff like that out there. And then you're putting a third of it into the rainy day fund. That is basically the path that we've headed, and I'm simplifying it because it doesn't work out exactly to a third, 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 but if you looked at it over a long term on what we're doing, it does work out to being a uh, long term. And by the, rainy, the, by the way, the rainy day fund is setting at $1.16 billion. So it's over a billion dollars. Uh, we're in a good spot. We're in the top 10% in, in the country when it comes to the states. And I would add one other thing. There's $400 million parked in the personal income tax reserve fund that the governor didn't veto. We thought it was going to line item veto that, but he didn't. But So that $400 million is parked over there. If you put that $400 million o over and counted that into the rainy day fund, uh, that, that, that's... That's over $1.5 billion, almost $1.6 billion in our rainy day fund, and that's a lot when you consider what our general revenue budget is. And it would probably make us number one, if not number one, number two in the nation when it comes to managing that. And everybody says, well, you're parking all that money over there. Well, what happens is that helps keep your interest rates down. It makes it so that you save money on the back end, and that actually affects counties and municipalities and school boards and all as well of when it comes into that place. So that helps out with that. But if we run into a problem, of, then we've got some reserves to be able to work from. What's the ratio you're supposed to keep for an ideal bond rating, Craig? Is it 25%? No, it's of the ideal is anywhere from 16 to 23. It depends on who you talk to mm -hmm. on that. And uh, we we exceed the 23 right now. And this is one of my arguments that I don't like going over 23, Let's or even say 25. Uh, because you can better utilize that money in tax reductions or capital improvements. Uh, but this is not a dictatorship. We work together collectively with the executive, the legislature, the House, and the Senate. Uh, we have a lot of different variables that come into play where you actually uh, massage everything into place. You c compromise is what you do to get us to where we need to do be, but it's working. Uh, but, May I jump over to pensions real quick sure. for a second, too, because that has a bearing. And all this has a bearing on economic development, too. If a business wants to increase, of, of expand, or locate the state of West Virginia, they're not going to come anywhere uh, close to the state. If we do not have a balanced budget, we do not have a way to actually give them uh, some assurances that they're not going to be taxed to death when they get here. Well... The pension system is one of those ones that in 1992 it was 6% funded. And then the legislature then set itself on a course to get ourselves better funded. Right now, uh, our worst funded pension is 78.6%. That's last year's numbers. We're over 80% when they come to get done with this. 80% funded is fully funded, in my opinion. Now, the rest of them, though, we have in this state are 100% fund it or better there may be one that's mm -hmm. down below that but it's a small pension uh the ones with the big numbers so what i'm getting at when i s talk about these pensions is is that if you're a state employee or you're in the pension system uh one of the things that you can be assured of and that is we've got a solvent pension system that is well managed in this state i'm very proud of that but you're also have to understand it's part of the economic development tool that we have too because again who wants to go to Illinois right now with the pension system that they have out there? Who wants to go to California and locate a business of, or, or expand a business in California? It's, it's not going to happen to a greater degree because their pension systems are train wrecks. So train wrecks. When, it, when a pension system is uh, fully funded, so let's, let's say, not, not even use the word fully, let's say it's 100% funded, does that mean that 
for every single person who's currently working who can someday draw a pension, that that money's already there now? Or does it mean that if every person who is eligible to retire right now retired, it would be funded now? It makes it so that everybody that's eligible to retire would be fully funded. And and you have to keep in mind that pensions are projections, mm-hmm. okay? To, 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 you, if we had, let's say COVID, God forbid, came through and it affected our seniors, uh, and it did. But let's say the, the loss ratio would have been uh, 50%. Well, you would have lost 50% of those retirees of uh, there, and that would and they wouldn't have collected any more of their pension. Now, that pension would have grown, and it's when it's projected out, it would have grown. So if, if everybody passed away, the money would be not needed. Right, because you're that, not paying a pen, you can't yeah, pay you, a pension to a dead person. That's right, you can't pay it to a dead person. So the, 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 this is all built around projections, and, and then you, you factor in the volatility of the stock market and the investment strategies they have, of and one of the things that, and you got to applaud the people of West Virginia. There was a point in time of, and I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was in the '90s that we made the constitutional amendment. That made it so that we could actually invest in the stock market. Uh, before we were not allowed to invest in the stock market via our constitution, and that actually deterred us. It got us into the six percent funded pension system because of the fact that you could only invest in certain things, and that was it. And so, when the, the stock market may have been getting a fifteen percent return of the money markets or whatever they would have been investing in may have been only getting two. That was money that was left on the table, and the stock market historically performs far better than any other investment there is out there Mm -hmm. long term. And that's what pensions are, is a long term. Do you see, with the funding of these pensions, do you see a day when there is an annual cost of living adjustment? To the, those who receive pensions, we've did. Uh, I don't see an annual cost of the. I don't see an annual cost of living adjustment, but we have made adjustments in the past. Sometimes it's one-time payments. Sometimes it's uh, the change changes on how much you get per month or, or per year, how you want to look at that. Uh, we just recently did one for that, and it was a combination of both. Uh, Eric Nelson, who is my pension chair, uh, I t- tasked him with uh, working on this a little bit because let's say you were my school teacher uh, when I was in school, and you lived, you retired when you were 60 years old, but you lived another 40 years. And your wages for being the school teacher at that point in time might have been some of the best wages you could get, $30,000 a year. Well, $30,000 a year and the pension that was built on that doesn't work. Okay, so you got to be able to have a cost of living adjustments for it. Uh, but th- these are fixed amounts of that they know that they're going to get. If you calculate your pension up, each and every person can go and see what that pension is going to bring in to you. For the first 10 years on it, I have no sympathy for that type of a plan uh, for wanting to make any adjustments on that because you know what you're going to get. But if you've outlived the time period where the average where you're expected to be mathematically, yet we have an obligation to go back and help the, those. And we have. And historically, we have done that in the past. I think when I first started, uh, the floor was five hundred um, dollars a month, and it's a thousand now. Uh, so we've changed that it, uh, accordingly. Mm-hmm. I hope that answered the question because it gets complicated. We and you want to do that, but you can't blow up the system by doing what you just suggested mm-hmm. uh, because that that will do that. And when you uh, have it based on fixed amount then you know for certain that that's what you're going to get and you won't be in that fluctuating and we actually tried to change the pension system a couple years ago and everybody uh, shifted over and it was more like a 401k where you had a match and all and everybody got back out of that and bought their way back in to the system do you foresee a future where you get out of the pension system entirely and turn it over to a, an individual account like an a like a uh, 401k not in my lifetime Let's put it that way. Now, I'm getting towards the end of my life, too. Uh, 
but I'd say not in my lifetime. And the reason for it is, is there are, this is one of the advantages when you hear about state employees and, and uh, government employees, one of the advantages to being that employee is to have a pension system of that, that offsets maybe some lower wages and the predictabilities of uh, that, that, that happens that way. And once you get them, to, 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 okay, here's the next reason. If we were 6% funded or less, then yes, uh, for the, the, you could see that, but do, nobody's going to change anything when you're fully funded. So that's, so that, how that's are, where it's going to stay. How are pensions for public employees calculated? Is it is it X percent of the top three years? Is it that kind of a, of a calculation? There's two different pensions for that. Uh, there used to be called high three, now it's a high five. We've changed some of that. Uh, to make it so that it's more realistic. Uh, there was people gaming the system. There's still people gaming the system. I'll give w one example that goes on throughout the state, and that is, is, let's say that you're a teacher and you're making, mm, I don't know, $55,000 a year, $60,000 a year. Of, and we actually have this thing in place where we can actually pay them to go to school uh, while they're still a teacher of and they can actually get a pay increase for doing that and but they study administration and so now there's an opening that comes up in the board office and they apply for doing that and by the way this teacher is a great teacher have just produced a tremendous amount of great students because they're great in the classroom and they become an administrator and they're towards the end of their career and but that, that administrative job now pays $125,000 a year that is high three, high five, it doesn't make any difference. That really blows up the system because now you're multiplying off the 125 times the year's service and all that. And so you've doubled your pension on going out the last couple of years. Now, here's the bad part about this. They could be a terrible administrator, a great teacher and a terrible administrator, and there is no way to get them back into the classroom. This is a struggle that we've dealt with in the legislature on why and we want to be able to keep our great teachers in the classroom. We want them to be able to be producing those students and we want to be able to pay them for their value. You want to do the same thing for your administrators also. You want to have those great administrators being able to make the, the worthy money on that, but you, 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 so we got to be able to see it in the outcomes of our, our students. Um, I, 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 I'd use the school system as an example for that. I'm not beating anybody up. It is what it is of what's going on. But the high three, the high five of, is out there. And I don't, again, I don't see anything changing from that standpoint. So I hope I asked, mm -hmm. answered your question. From Christmas Day. And uh, by the way, uh, we will not be on Christmas week as uh, we did uh, during Thanksgiving week. The boss shuts us down during that week. And uh, one year, uh, Craig actually thought we had been fired because we weren't on the entire <laughs> week. There was rejoicing amongst the population. <laughs> get rid of those bums. Get them out of there. Now, now everybody goes to Mexico, right? <laughs> everybody goes to Mexico. At least one person does. <laughs> uh, and uh, my understanding is uh, also we will have uh, an open house on the 15th here at the radio station and uh, TV 10 where you can drop by late morning, early afternoon and uh, say hello or whatever. And we'll get you more details on that as that uh, date gets closer here. Mr. Craig Blair, state uh, Senate president is with us and he also functions as Lieutenant governor. Of course, you mentioned earlier about the severance taxes and how Berkeley County gets a sliver of that. Obviously not as much as the se real severance tax producing counties get is there a way Berkeley County gets even in that regard, Craig, because we produce more personal income tax because we have more people working here? Yeah, it's got uh, parts to do with the school aid funding formula and the property taxes associated with that also. And, and so it, it does balance out from that standpoint. As we were talking earlier, when I was much younger, 
of in the 60s and 70s we were more agrarian here in the eastern panhandle there's a lot of, what was it 40,000 people that lived here uh, something like that and uh, i can tell you right now that uh, severance taxes of the coal counties of uh, counties like mcdowell county that had over a hundred thousand people mm-hmm. living in it and now they've got twenty thousand that some of their tax dollars came here to help educate me to educate the, the students of our age group. Uh, we're working, to, but it's a, a smoothing mechanism. That's what we do uh, by t- all the counties being working together and having the State Board of Education and having the funding formula that uh, makes this work. And it's been balancing out over the years. We uh, are going to, what we need to do is number one is locality pay. Uh, and to, I shouldn't use that word. It should be differential pay uh, because the cost of a loaf of bread is the same in West Virginia throughout, basically. What it, the difference is is the cost of housing and the taxes associated with that housing. And we need to really be able to address that. But here's how you get there. And that is, is right now we have more have-nots than what we have have counties. And that's why I'm talking about is growth counties versus non-growth counties. This is when, and we were talking about this off air, if you take $100 million and you invest it into a large billion-dollar company that's coming into the state of West Virginia that creates, creates jobs, not to, you can take that $100 million and put it to education, and it's gone that year or the t- in two years. But if you put it into a business that generates jobs and economic prosperity for a given area, it lifts that area up. And it does it for generations, and it does it with inflationary factor built into it as well because the wages grow, the commodity prices, the uh, corporate net, all those things grow along with that. And so the best way for us to keep more of it in the eastern panhandle where we're a growth area is to have more growth areas joining us in our fight together in the state of west virginia and this is exactly what we're attempting to do in the legislature is to create those growth areas and you can see that in monongalia county north central west virginia you're going to see some movement in the northern panhandle mason county it's coming back the putnam county it the the the, um, the tax revenues, the investments are coming back. I was somewhere the other day, and it was interesting listening to the conversation because they were not talking directly to me. They were talking to each other. And I don't hear very well, but I could hear them saying that West Virginia is, when corporate America is looking, we're in the top five states. The top five states for them looking to say, hey, West Virginia is the place you need to go. West Virginia is where it's at. And that is because of all the work that we've done over the last seven years since the Republicans took over. I'm very proud of that. Uh, And you can see all those aspects of it. So I guess this is my spot where I get to weave in the personal income tax. It would be helpful. Uh, And for your listeners, I was telling them off the air that, you know, when I talk about the numbers uh, at the end of the month and everything, it's boring because I'm just reading numbers. And this has been the most fun that I've had being able to give this report because we're weaving it in with the stories that go along with why we do what we're doing. The personal income tax collections for the month was $140 million. It was $9.3 million above revenue estimates for the year were $130 million above revenue estimates. And that's with the tax cut kicked in? That's with a 21.25% reduction in the personal income tax, so that's not being deducted off your paycheck right now. Uh, Now, and that that doesn't include the uh, personal property tax where you'll get a refundable tax credit on that. So when to, next year, when you do, if you spent uh, $500 on your automobiles and everything, you'll get 250 of it back next year on your personal income taxes, a refundable tax credit. If you paid no personal income tax, you get a check back for that amount of money. Uh, if you're a small business owner and you got less than $1 million worth of taxable assets on the personal property level, you'll get that back, 50% of that back on your taxes. 
that's a big deal. There's one for veterans also uh, that covers them. I don't remember the exact details on that one. Uh, I'll come back to, I'll text that back to you when sure. the time's right for that. Uh, but that's not factored into that. So what we're to, what you're not being withheld right now, you'll probably end up getting back unless you make big wages and drive a cheap car of uh, you'll get back mm-hmm. of on your personal income tax sales tax collections also of uh, is of uh, for the collections were 162 million for the month uh that was 5.4 million dollars above revenue estimates and were 17.3 above for the year again good numbers of and what one of the things I left off the personal income tax. Yes, there's wage inflation, of uh, out there. Uh, there's been that, and there's a shortage of people going to work, and and that has a bearing on wage inflation. But it's doing to, to anybody that wants a job, can actually have a job in this state right now, no matter where you're at. I was in one of the southern counties, and they had help wanted signs up at the drive-throughs of for that. So there, and if we pass my personal not mine, excuse me, our um, unemployment, and I'm wanting to rename unemployment to reemployment. That sends a message out to corporate America that we're we're working on getting our people back into the workforce. But right now in the state of West Virginia, uh, the total labor workforce is 793,600. The employment level is 769,100. The unemployed is 29.5, but that doesn't mean that they're looking for jobs. But the checks going out, the amount of checks that's written each week is 6,198. So the numbers are really, really low. Uh, now, there's going to be people that's going to be coming off the Medicaid rolls that are going to have the opportunity uh, to get back into the workforce. And there are going to be gainful employment opportunities out there. And that's the trick. That's the trick that we want to do. Uh, if you're on some sort of an entitlement, I don't care what it is, and then you're able to work for cash, it comes up. Let's say your entitlement gives you $20,000 a year, and you work for cash for another $20,000 a year. You need to make it so that you're drawing a W-2 for $50,000 a year. And that makes it so that it's far more advantageous to be working in a job that could have benefits, that could have health care, which actually helps with our health care institution so that they're not paying, the government's not paying for it at a lower rate. You're getting the private health care industry into the game. This is all, it's one big stew that you're, and that's why I keep saying a holistic approach on how we go by doing things, and then we look at it to be able to lift all people up. Matt Miller. When you look at the sales tax, I know there's a, a lot of conversation at times of, of how many counties are, are border counties, and it's easy sometimes for someone to go into another county. Do you see a lot of fluctuations uh, in the sales tax You know, from those that may go into, say, uh, Maryland or Virginia in our eastern panhandle and make purchases as opposed to buying here? It, it used to be way worse than what it is mm-hmm. today. Okay, uh, it, it was nothing of to be able to go and see uh, of West Virginians outside the state spending their tax dollars. Uh, it's changed somewhat on that. Uh, the people in West Virginia, first of all, you're having opportunities to be able to make those purchases in state now. It didn't used to be that way. It, you were hard pressed to buy a TV <laughs> in the state of West Virginia. Uh, And if you go across the lines, you go there and pay it, and the tax would be less. Food was one of the ones that drove that. Okay, so we had a food tax in this state, and then our surrounding states did not, except for, I think, Virginia. Um, Virginia had a very low number for a food tax. Uh, I lose track of time. By the way, I mean, the website was called nofoodtax.com, and we got rid of that, but it took us. Uh, almost a decade to get it phased out. Uh, and they did 1% of the time on that. But when you went to buy your food over there, uh, out of state where you weren't being taxed, that's when you bought your TV, that's when you bought your gasoline, you bought a lot of things like that. I have people come up to me all the time and say, you ought to go back and tax in the food. That's the fairest tax there is. Well, not in the environment. If your surrounding states aren't taxing it, what you do is you lose those cross-border sales. Now, I think it's an immoral tax. Taxing food? Mm-hmm. 
Well, the, the, and, and the, that's a prerogative one. Now, now you, do you complain about the tax on your food when you go through the drive thru No, because that's convenience food. Okay. I, I don't need to go to a drive thru to live, but I do need to eat to live. I would argue that I do. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go to the store, pack yourself a little lunch, and eat it while you're driving around in your car. <laughs> I seen my wife slicing cucumbers yesterday, and I was wondering about no drive through for me. <laughs> Again, that's why I'm on the short term list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, they check off Craig's pension. That's just not going to get paid out in full. But, <laughs> but, but the human uh, behavior uh, cycle and going across the border, I think that we have helped balance that mm-hmm. out somewhat uh, f- from from that standpoint. And and I think that's a good thing. So, are you able to track out of state coming into state and those tax dollars? No. Okay. No, they're, they're, that's hard to do, especially when it comes to the sales tax. Uh, well, how do they do it with tourism, Craig? Well, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, you're looking at motels and hotels more so for that, and then they're able to get traffic counts coming off the interstate for certain things. I'm not an expert on that one, but they've, and they've got formulas that probably are set by the industry itself that mm-hmm. can actually tell you that if you're at staying at a hotel, you're going to spend X amount into that community and stuff like that. It's Chelsea Ruby territory, I guess. Right? Yes. And then, you know, I ought to give a shout out to her. Uh, she has done just an absolutely wonderful job. I think tourism is up in the state, what, 30, 40 percent of on that and and that is a component you want people to stop you want people to stop and spend money you want them to spend money in our drive-throughs you want them to buy gasoline that was one of the biggest arguments that uh we were making you brought this up earlier when the teachers and all wanted pia to be funded by the severance tax i said no that's a terrible idea we're not going to go there because it's cyclic it goes up and down the best thing that we could do is make it so that we're attractive to the people outside the state that wants to come into the state to spend money, whether it's tourism, whether it's to buy home goods, whether it's to buy whatever. Uh, and that will make it so that we're able to tax somebody outside the state just like they tax us, okay? And we pick up those revenues. That's why. Uh, the, the, the 1% on the municipalities, I have no problems with being able to do that. And I used to. I thought that that would actually tax people to go on out of the state for that 1%, but it's not the case. Uh, the, the, the revenues are staying the same as what they were uh, before. In fact, they may even be a little bit better. And it's helping the sti- cities. It's helping to revitalize the cities that have that tax. Uh, but I just wish they would actually take it off the B&O. Uh, because the B&O, whether a business makes a profit or not, it has to pay this tax. You shouldn't be taxed when you're not making a profit. That That, that is inherently wrong on, on that part of the system, and that's how you end up with cities that have a lot of storefront vacancies in the front of them. And that was what our hope was by giving that 1% that it would help revitalize our downtowns. But I can tell you what revitalizes any downtown. And that is population growth. It comes back to what we were just talking about earlier is by having job opportunities and people moving into the area that lifts up downtowns. But in order to draw these people in, we have to be able to get them from one place to the other. And we have some real road issues. When people, individuals, cut costs and save money, they do it so that they can go and buy something cool, right? Or they can pay off their debts or whatever. Listen to Dave Ramsey after this show. We've got a rainy day fund. I don't know when the rainy day fund is full, but I I know that we've got big surpluses. When does this, when do we start spending all of this money that we have been saving and put it in form, say, of roads? Well, you teed that one up really high, so I'm going to pull my driver out. <laughs> uh, and that is is that as we worked our way to these tax reductions, we had four years of the flatline budget. Each year, we actually moved to the road fund, for instance. Uh, the first year was $100 million. That first year that we moved $100 million to the road fund, that exceeded more than it's ever been added to the road fund in the history of the state of West Virginia. 
in the history. Now, we did the next year at 130, then the next year at 150, and then the next year at 150. That's on top of the Roads to Prosperity, where the people voted themselves a little bit of a tax increase on the gas tax of on that. And so we are to, and the work is being done on the roads. The problem with that is, is that you can't fix everything at one time. If you do, then they'll all come due the same time again, whatever the life expectancy is. Let's call it 20 years. Some roads are different from others, excuse me. But the road fund, our collections on that, of we, when it comes to gasoline, we're $5 million under of for the year right now. But on the privilege tax, we're $10 million over. Licenses and registrations, we're $13 million under. Uh, the highway litter control is 84000 under. Miscellaneous, we're 169 over. And federal reimbursements, we're 113 over. So right now, we're setting at $275 million to the good on our road fund collections uh, on that. So I'm, I'm somewhat excited from that standpoint. And then we've got another one that we've got cooking that's going to generate in probably three to four years about 150 to $200 million a year. And that is is that we West Virginia is ahead of the curve when it comes to our DMV. And I know nobody's believed me when I say <laughs> that. Uh, but our DMV commissioner is a proactive guy, and we're going to see what I'm wanting before long where you're going to be able to renew your tags by holding your phone up out there on it. But... To be able to just scan your license plate? Yes. Uh, but like U-Haul and Enterprise and Hertz and all that, they want one-stop shopping for titling and all that. And we are at the front edge of being able to do that. We changed our statute to be able to do that uh, this past year. And it's going to generate a significant amount of revenue that is going to go directly to the road fund. It doesn't come into general revenue, and it helps offset the expenses. Montana actually took our legislation and copied it word for word on that. You know what they don't have that we do have? People. <laughs> <laughs> There's only about 600,000 in Montana, right? <laughs> well, that's wrong answer. <laughs> uh, the, 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 our t system on what we operate the DMV, and I know it sounds like I'm lying again, but we're way ahead of the curve on the electronic, how we do manage our software and what we do with that. And it made it so that we are about three years ahead of anybody else in the country. So we're going to own this and be able to do it. And Montana did it, but they're hand processing. They got people up there going through and doing this. And my goal is, is to make it so that we can manage a title in less than five minutes and so be able to get that back out so that you you're working at the speed of business not the speed of government and then west virginia and the people of west virginia then will benefit from that senate president craig blair our guest here uh, room maybe for one or two more questions matt as far as the uh, the personal income tax and and you mentioned the 130 million dollars ahead and so forth what is the next trigger as far as any uh, additional reduction <laughs> You're going to ask me that. The next trigger is supposed to be 10% of reduction. If you, t I'm going to have to send in the document because it's convoluted. Mm -hmm. On, but it, what it's a triggering mechanism that's set up to be real. Okay. In other words, we do not want to trigger down the t a personal tax income tax reduction if the revenues aren't there. This is why I'm talking about the $400 million that is set in the personal income tax reserve fund doesn't need to be there. We've got a real triggering mechanism that's in place that will make it so that if we've got the additional revenues, that the funds will always be there to be able to handle that. We were adamant about doing that, but I do not have that. I'd have to have that written down for me to be able to tell you right. because it is, it's complicated, but it's... I know what, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get Eric Tarr to, to, uh, to reach back in here on that yeah, one. We'll try to get Eric on would. on Thursday. Uh, because that, that he's he's an expert on that, and he helped create that. But we're, what we're doing more than anything, though, is looking at out long term. Mm -hmm. Always think of it as a smoothing mechanism that you do not want to get yourself, put yourself into a cycle of up and down. And if you give too much of a tax reduction, then you got to go back. The last thing I ever want to do is to come back and look at everybody and say, we're going to have to do a tax increase. Nobody wants to do that. 
And let me say one other thing, too, about reducing taxes. 30 seconds. And, and controlling it. The flat growth or, or, or controlling that will actually bring out of our system problems, problems that need to be addressed. By controlling that spending, that flat line budget actually makes it so that you become aware of it instead of being hidden in the dark corners of government. All right, and you got out in time, too. <laughs> you're getting better at this. Thank you. It's better. It's easier in person. When you're on the phone, you can't see the clock. <laughs> Here, you got the clock right. right. Are we done? Uh, We've got a final minute coming up. Don't Go. run away just yet. It's uh, 9.57. Uh, two minutes, and we'll right back. <laughs> 